Okay, I'm Val Sada and I'm one of the um, MGS members and a fellow of the MGS and um, my practice site is nursing. So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Bogracus is board certified in family medicine and emergency medicine. And while serving as a USAABF ringside physician in 1991, he earned the AOASM Galen Society Certificate of Added Qualifications in Sports Medicine. Colonel Bogracus served 28 years with the Department of Defense. His last assignment was Chief Warrior Transition Division Clinical Operations at the North Atlantic Regional uh, Medical Command. As Chief, he provided clinical oversight for the recovery and rehabilitation of soldiers within the 22 state NARMC region. The position involved active teaching and training of 160 nurse case managers within the region, clinical surveillance in the rehabilitation process, and liaison operations with civilian, VA, and military healthcare systems. He has worked in the Maryland VA system, served as medical director, director neurorestorative national capital area uh, in severe traumatic brain injury, and currently serves as a consultant to the Psychiatric Continuity Service, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and to Home Mind, the Danish Wounded Warrior Project. Dr. Bogracus served on the Maryland Brain Injury Association Board of Directors from 2009 to 2012. He has been an active advanced trauma life support instructor at Cowley Shock Trauma in Baltimore, Maryland for 20, 20 years and has experience ranging from pre-hospital trauma to PMNR recovery. Mm -hmm. He currently serves as the president-elect for the American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine. Current interests include supporting the White House Joining Forces Initiative and current drug policies through medical education. Colonel Bogracus graduated from the U.S. Naval War College with distinction in 2009 and has received his MA in National Security and Strategic Studies with an area of study in irregular warfare and narco-terrorism with distinction in 2011. He is a clinical professor of military science, family medicine, and emergency medicine at the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine, and is an assistant professor in military and emergency medicine at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. So it's with our great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Teresa was one of our case managers in the New England. I'm sorry. Huh? And Christy. I'm sorry. It's been 10 years. It's been 10 years. Thank you so much. It's really a privilege to be here. Can you hear me? Can you see me? It's really a privilege to be here. Uh, I wanted to share. I wanted to share lessons learned from the military. And. Uh, I wanted to uh, pay respect to uh, the older veterans. So basically, I'm a Yero. I want to see how that was spelled. Oh, I mean, if, if you've read Thucydides, if you've read Thucydides, I'm a Yero, a Yerosia. So 30 years in the military, now I'm an elder. And what I like to do is I like to teach the younger physicians. So on Fridays, I'm, I'm with the uh, Psychiatric Continuity Service. Uh, I have an operational background. I'm not a psychiatrist. And I come up to Maine every month. I have for a few years to work with our students here. I want to take lessons learned from what I learned in the military, especially in uh, TBI, or traumatic brain injury, and see if we can work and think about circuitry as we discuss the older brain. That's my dad, 
the Navy guy, and my uncle Nick. So I don't have, I don't have, uh, I'm not taking any money from the pharmaceutical companies, from the cannabis industry, from the mob. I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> my background, my background is from the American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine. This is where I learned most of my addiction. You learn about addiction in the emergency room, and you learn about it in different academy meetings. I joined the Academy of Addiction Medicine because I was volunteered to be the consultant for drug and alcohol when I was a major. But I've stayed with it because it's a fa it's, as you know, it's a fascinating field, and you want to prevent people from traumatizing themselves and others. I was on the board of directors for the Brain Injury Association, and when I was chief of, the cl of clinical operations, I was engaged with all 22 states in the, in the North Atlantic region. So there's a lot to learn there. I understand, is anybody here from the main, the main Brain Injury Association? But, but they, they will meet, they'll meet in Portland in October. So that's something to look for, something to look for, because traumatic brain injury is now within the DSM-5 neurocognitive disorders. I think there's a lot to learn. What do you say, doctor? I agree. There's always a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. I think it's important to, with every encounter, with every brain we encounter, we learn. It's the Japanese say, onigaishimasu. So when we, when we meet, we say, teach me. So with, with the Brain Injury Association, I've learned a great deal there. Uh, Diverbeck Defense Veteran Brain Injury so uh, Center. These are good websites. They're in, this, they're in your slides. I like to put my websites up front in the slides. So when I'm gone, you can just tap into them. I took 10 nurses out to the National Center for PTSD. That's another great place to train. And as you know, one of our centers is in White River Junction that some of our students will be going to, which is great. I think it's great. Uh, also, as part of my introduction, I was, when I retired, uh, can I say retired here? <laughs> Not retired. What? A deferment. <laughs> when I left the Army, when I left the Army, I, I became the uh, medical director for neurorestorative. And at NeuroRestorative, it's a 10-bed it's a facility outside of Walter Riggs in Germantown. And we have our troops there have all been severely injured, so severe traumatic brain injury. So remember your glass calcoma skill. Many of these young troopers, soldiers, Marines, they, they were glass calcoma skill of three. So one day, going to make rounds, and... Uh, Dan, Dan is a, was a ranger, army ranger, got, got injured in Iraq, then came back home, then deployed to Afghanistan, then was exposed to a blast, then came back home, then, like young soldiers, got himself a, a what we call a crotch rocket. So he got on a motorcycle, risk-taking behavior, drove himself into a tree. Anyways, he was a Glasgow coma skill of three. So now he's back, survives. Now he's back walking, talking, doing great, doing great. And I go to the house to make rounds. Hey, Doc, how you doing? Good, Dan. Want some coffee? Yeah. We walk over to the coffee maker. He goes, you know how to do this? Oh, yeah. So let's make 10 cups. We'll put 10 cups of water in. OK. Uh, you know how to do this, Doc? Yeah, yeah. So, Dan, I like to have one scoop per two cups. Okay, so we do that. Anyways, what I'm referring to, as everybody knows what I'm referring to, is ex executive functioning. Then the next day, I fly home to see my dad. So he's 90. Hey, Bill, good to be home, huh? Want some coffee? Yeah. So, go over to the coffee pot in the kitchen. You know how to do this? So I think there's a lot of similarities. I mean, the brain is the brain. Some people try to differ, 
but we're here today to understand the circuitry. Uh, objectives, I do like the DSM-5. Do you like the DSM-5 or 4? Uh, still getting used to 5. Still getting used to 5. But I'm an ER doctor. I'm an emergency medicine doctor, so I like the 4. I like the 4. I grew up with the 3. I like the 4. And as, as Dr. Uh, Singer is kind of alluding to, the DSM-5 misses I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't read your mind, but I, I'm trying to. I'm playing a psychiatrist here. So, you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the, DS, the DSM-4 versus the DSM-5, sometimes the, the diagnosis of PTSD, I miss. It's common. I make that joke about psychiatrists and reading, reading your mind because that's a frequent joke. So, sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot. But with the DSM-5, I want to talk about the DSM-5, uh, particularly the neurocognitive disorders, and review that because I'm here to learn. Uh, and as an osteopath, osteopathic physician, we always, always, always talk about structure and function. But with the brain, I don't, I'm not talking about cube, uh, these cubes, what do you call those cubes? Cubics? Rubik's? Rubik's cubes? Hmm? Word loss, right? That's part of my language. So Rubik's cubes. I don't really like that Rubik's Cube. It's easier to learn, but I'd rather approach it from circuitry. Because I was brought up by my dad, that Navy guy, who was electrician's mate. So we always talk about circuitry. The, the, this lecture here, where, where are the educators, the nursing educators? Uh-huh. So do you, how many lectures are given uh, that support the Joining Forces Initiative? where you're at. None? Very few. But remember, Mrs. Obama and Mrs. Biden met with all the deans and said, you, the next generation will be talking about PTSD and yep, TBI, traumatic brain injury. So this supports the White House Joining Forces Initiative, but I, I want to talk about the older troops. So, it's my Uncle Nick. So, Donna, when you look at that uniform, what, is that, what do you ask him? So, I saw this picture. My Uncle Nick was in assisted living at 94. He had fallen. So, he's in assisted living. My, my cousin Patty brings a picture of Uncle Nick by his bedside. So, I walk in. What do you think I say about that uniform? What? What? Wrinkle. Well, <laughs> well, that was 19, 1945, so it just, <laughs> that was wool. Uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is when you're looking at a uniform, uh, some of your residents may, be, may have served in Korea, Vietnam, anywhere, current. Look, see those wings? So it gives you an idea of pre-deployment. Right? Aviators. Aviators, pre-deployment, uh, spatial, pre-deployment, intellect. Right? So, but those were his wings, but underneath the wings is a sharpshooter badge. I said, Uncle Nick, you got your wings and you got a sharpshooter badge. He goes, well, what you think? I was a tail gunner. So my Uncle Nick was shot down twice in Burma. Shot down twice, canopy was okay and nobody in his, uh, in his aircraft, B-17, were injured. Okay, I'm talking about, so I'm sharing trauma with you. So next day, well, I go home, and I take the picture of me off of my father's refrigerator, right? I got my wings. I give it to Uncle Nick. He goes, hey, you got a lot of egg salad on your chest. I said, yeah, 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 Uncle Nick, but I get ribbings for being alive. He goes, oh, okay. He goes, you know, the only important ribbon here is that blue ribbon on the walker. What blue, what, what's that about? He goes, I can go to the gym anytime I want. <laughs> right? Independent. My Uncle Nick played ball. He played ball, and like I said, he got shot down twice and he wanted to go back up. So he was kind of hardy. So that blue ribbon meant more to him. The blue ribbon on the walker when he was 94 going down to PT without assistance. That's big time. My aunt. 50 years ago, 
uh, my cousin on his way to Nam, on his way to Nam. Uh, my uncle Nick didn't know where Burma was, and my cousin, even though this picture is taken after his surgical residency at the Mary Hitch Hitchcock, he didn't know where Vietnam was, but they went. Uncle Nick, the difference between World War II and uh, Vietnam, the World War II guys deployed for the duration of the war. Okay. Uncle Pete, grandmother, point here, families are so important, pre-deployment, post-deployment, and deployment. Grandmother, my Uncle Nick used to write letters home. This is before email, right? And we saw the cons uh, we, we saw Dear John emails, right, when we were on active duty. But that was before emails. So my Uncle Nick would write letters home to Dover, New Hampshire. Everything's fine. Um, teaching math and coaching basketball in San Antonio because he didn't want her to get worried. So you've seen these guys, exterior tough guys, interior good guys. But Rocco is a different story. Rocco, Rocco got shot uh, at uh, Guadalcanal, got shot in the belly, left for dead. Medics came by, found him, and he, at that time he was in a pile of bodies. They found him moving, rescued him, took him to the hospital. He ended up marrying his Connie, uh, ended up marrying Connie, right here. Ended up marrying Connie, spending 20 years in the, in the Marine Corps, went to Korea. The important thing about the Korean vets and the important part about this story here with Rocco, although he was shot and left for dead, the trauma of career is what gave him the intrusive thoughts at night, i.e. chosen, frozen, right. Chosen, frozen, right. The chosen, frozen, gave him the nightmares at night. Why? Because you have to think about trauma, well, I think about trauma like I think about radiation. Duration, intensity, dose, etc. That's the teaching point there. That's the teaching point there. Any, we okay with that? You remember, frozen, chosen. You're cold. You're frozen. There's blood on the snow. You're going forward. You what? You're frozen, right? You're trapped. How many people have been to the Korean War Memorial in D.C.? Right. It's powerful. Uh, same aunt. So my aunt rides shotgun with me. I drive my dad's car. He's 90 here, going to the New Hampshire VA. Where, where are our New Hampshire VA folks? Oh, somewhere. Oh, Laura. All oh, right. So we went to the New Hampshire VA. I didn't really know where I was going because, again, what did you do in the service, right? What did I tell you my dad did? Yeah, WW2 guy, electrician. You don't have to ask about, oh, did you shoot anybody? Or how many deaths did you see? But you, do have, you should ask about occupation. So my dad was a World War II electrician, right? Navy in the belly of the ship, Pacific. So that should make you think, right, medical students? Medical students, you need to be thinking exposure, asbestosis. So this is why I took my dad at age 90 to the VA for the, that asbestosis. And he was having a good day. So we walked into compensation pension, and the, case, uh, the nurse said, wow, you're the fourth World War II vet I've seen this week. He said, you want me to walk out, walk back in? <laughs> so good humor, right? Social cognition, he was hot. My aunt, 97, she didn't want a wheelchair. I put my dad in a wheelchair because I really didn't know where I was going. So I was taking him around the hospital. She didn't want a wheelchair. Little lady at the desk said, ma'am, can I get you a wheelchair? No, honey. Ma'am, can I get you a wheelchair? No, dear. I thought she was going to pull a Robert De Niro from a taxi driver. <laughs> Are you talking to me? I'm only 97. <laughs> so, 
So, <clears throat> because of the asbestosis, when my dad would get a little hypoxic, he'd have changes in attention, right? He'd have changes in attention when he would became hypoxic. Or, of course, when he got a pneumonia, a viral pneumonia. So, this is what we talk about in the emergency room as delirium, right? You don't have to have delirium secondary to acute drug toxic, toxicity. And you all are shaking your head because delirium pushes that vulnerable brain over the edge, if you will. So your brain, our brains, I like, again, as I said before, my dad brought me up as a, he's an electrician, and you know what, wattage equals energy over time. So the longer you're working, thinking, the more wattage you're using. So fatigue, brain fatigue, if you will. But the piece about the delirium for the medical students <clears throat> is in the DSM-4, all the dialogue or, or, or discussion of the neurocognitive disorders begins with delirium. It's very important. Why? Because it's reversible, right? Right, Leah? Because it's reversible. And it's reversible, and your job as a physician in the emergency room or on the wards and nurses is to identify the cause and to change that. Because when you slip down, you have an injury that's difficult to compensate for because you lose your resilience. So <clears throat> delirium's temporary. You have to think of your medical problems, underlying medical problems like hypoxia, drug toxicity. So yeah, yeah, lots of drugs, and we, all, we always think about alcohol and acute alcohol toxicity, et cetera. But in this population, uh, in the, in the, with vulnerable brains, with any brains, we have to be thinking of anticholinergic cognitive burden. And those drugs include simple drugs like Tylenol PM, Advil PM, because we need sleep. People need sleep to wash out those toxins. So we don't often think about these over-the-counter drugs. We think about, oh, what's really uh, anticholinergic, you know, like tricyclics and other types of drugs. But this drug toxicity is very important. Again, as I mentioned, it doesn't cause uh, structural brain damage. ASAM, good point, good time to bring up ASAM definition because uh, Amer American Society of Addiction Medicine is talking about circuitry. <coughs> As we learn more about circuitry, we learn more about how the brain operates, okay? And the definition of addiction includes chronic disease, different circuitry, different circuitry. This circuitry is brain reward, motivation, memory, but it is circuitry. So, oops, sorry. So for the medical students and nursing students and all of us as students, when we talk about dementia, we begin with D, but I really don't like the term dementia. Dementia, to, to go into an office and have a physician say that you have dementia is like being a young trooper who got dinged, who got punched in the head or hit his head and has a concussion, and now you're telling the, the soldier, oh, you have a traumatic brain injury, right? Concussion is mild traumatic brain injury. So I don't say to Joe, Joe, you have traumatic brain injury. You can't play ball anymore. I said, yeah, Joe, you suffered a concussion. But you do have neuroplasticity and you're going to drive on, right? So <clears throat> with this mnemonic for delirium, the medical students don't, yeah, think of dementia, but it's better to think of mild cognitive impairment there because with a mild cognitive impairment, a little bit of anticholinergic or a, anemia or an infection can push you over that edge, okay? The D. E, obviously, we always look for electrolyte disturbances. Sometimes we don't look for the magnesium, but... <clears throat> use that part of your differential. As I mentioned, hypoxia of the, lung, of the lung. Infection, we always think about, oh, does the patient have a UTI or a pneumonia? Always, always. Uh, we have to look for decubiti as well. Infection, it says infection, so infection of every system. Drugs, drugs, sure, there's a lot of, lots of drugs, particularly the sleepers, particularly the sleepers. And you can just Google, you can Google anticholinergic 
cognitive burden, and they list one, two, three types of drugs. But as you age, your sleep becomes quite important. Good sleep, good quality of sleep. And another lesson learned from military, all of our mild TBIs that Walter Reed, they all have sleep studies. Imagine that. They all have sleep studies. So with a, with a, with a traumatic brain injury, you are disrupting your, circuit, your sleep circuitry as well. Other parts about sleep, you know, how many people, uh, John, do you treat a lot of people with sleep apnea? Yeah, and so especially, you know, what we saw in the last 10 years, well, what we saw at Reed, Walter Reed, is a lot of young people, oh, they deploy the depressed. Well, they're not depressed, they have sleep apnea. They're tired, they're tired, and they're complaining of sleep, and because they deployed, you think they're depressed. So do, you know, primary care, doctors and nurses, social workers, everyone in the room, do a good sleep history. One thing about sleep that was interesting to me is that I read a, a hum, human study, patients with sleep apnea, people, people with sleep apnea had reversible changes on the imaging, uh, diffusion tensor imaging of the brain, reversible changes with CPAP. So things, so this is an, an, another new frontier, another new frontier. Uh, injury, of course, injury, trauma, trauma, trauma causes changing alertness. Uh, the unfamiliar environment, right? The unfamiliar environment at nighttime. Nighttime, you know, and of course everybody's nodding their head because I think people nodding their heads are leaving a night light on and saying good night to their people. Nighttime, it's nighttime. And that's why in skilled nursing facilities, at the bed, we have a calendar. That's why we have a calendar. This is what day it is, because it's difficult. You're in the room. You're, you're no longer in the house, your house. So you're in a room now, and it's you're gonna, easy to get disoriented. Unfamiliar environment, especially new admissions to your hospitals. Metabolic, as we mentioned before, to include thyroid, and diabetes. Okay? Uh, I'd like to go through this. So the, when we talk about major and mild, I really, major and mild, there's a change. And that's why I meant, that's why I talked about pre-deployment, deployment, post-deployment. Post so you can also think about pre-injury, post-injury. So there is a cognitive change from, from prior. The patient may know, the family may know, but someone has to tell you as the clinician. So, and these changes are in the neurocognitive dom domain such as complex attention, executive function, learning memory. Usually, usually it's the memory that brings people in to see a clinician. And, that, and I think what, what separates the, the mild from the major is right there in the ADLs, right there in the activities of daily living, and those are safety issues as well. And again, we have to rule out delirium. Uh, and other comorbid, other comorbidities. A patient would come in, if a patient is a new admit to your facility, that patient will, may become depressed. And that patient may have an underlying depression that they're doing well with or well controlled. But now, you remove them from their home, so you will have somebody with cognitive impairment plus depression. So this is what you have to tease out. Uh, and then, of course, rule out the other access ones. And it's good to specify, or at least I think it's good to specify or to try to think, what is the cause of this neurocognitive disorder? So, number one, Number one diagnosis is, I'm up there, most common diagnosis. Most common diagnosis is, is really Alzheimer's. I also teach public health, I also teach bioterrorism. So we talk about case definitions of possible, probable, and confirmed. So when, when, we, when you confirm these diagnoses, who confirms these diagnoses? 
pathologist. So many, many times these are not, many times these, are, these do not have the probable, such as Alzheimer's with the, with the genotype or uh, uh, the vascular with the neuroimaging. Okay, so Alzheimer's is number one. Number two is vascular. Uh, number three is Lewy body, Lewy body disease. The frontal temporal lo lobe de degeneration is about 10%. Others, such as HIV, uh, substance medication, use disorder, which I like to call toxic brain injury. Uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury is up there now. The proteins, the prion disease, infectious disease. Another, another good reason to ask uh, the veteran's travel history, right? Because you may have somebody deployed to Southeast Asia, may have Japanese encephalitis, right? May survive, come back home, and develop those cognitive changes from the viral infection, right? Oh, go ahead. So top three, top three Alzheimer's, right? And basically we're talking memory, memory, memory impairment. Uh, but we do have a genetic marker that will have a probable diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. And some in academic centers and research centers, there's uh, neuroimaging, uh, uh, right? The positron emission tomography, neuroimaging. I'll show you some cases in a minute uh, that assist with that probable diagnosis. The vascular disease, and you, history, history, history. So history, we used to talk about multi-infarct dementia with vascular disease. Now, it's better to think about decreased perfusion, I like to think, uh, decreased perfusion to different parts of the brain with the vascular. And the vascular piece two, your risk factors for vascular brain disease are the same for cardiovascular disease. So a healthy heart, a healthy brain. Exercise, uh, perfuse your brain is probably one of the best things we can do for our brain. The Lewy body, uh, Lewy body disease, uh, Dr. Lewy uh, described, well, Dr. Lewy found uh, Lewy bodies, which are alpha, which is an alpha protein, found in Parkinson's patients in the early 1900s, Dr. Lewy. So the differential between Lewy body disease, Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease is the, Lewy the dementia with Lewy body the motor disturbances are followed by behavior change in a window of one year. Where Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease with dementia, the Parkinsonian patient may develop neurocognitive changes outside of that one year or way down the line. So that's a simple definition. Here, the medical students, how many people have read Awakening? Right, so that's the great book, great book by Oliver Sack and, and Awakenings. What happened in Awakenings? What's, what is that book about? Awakenings versus the movie Awakenings. Anybody? Leah, did you read it? So when Oliver Sack, Oliver Sacks for the medical students and the nursing students, wow! If you could read Oliver Sacks' books. Uh, Awake, begin with awakenings and read the man who mistook his wife for a hat and right did you, you, you people right you read that that yeah, was fun the man who mistook his wife for a hat was had an interview the man, wife and husband going to see the neurologist psychiatrist everything's fine oh my goodness he's doing everything serial seven spelling word word backwards doing all these things then as he goes out to leave he grabs his wife's head and he tries to do this, oh. <laughs> right? But he has a lot of great case, def case studies in there. And he writes like a poet. The other part, too, is a leg to stand on when Oliver Sacks himself fell, 
broke his femur, dinged the femoral nerve, and the orthopod would come in every morning. Oh, bone looks good. I can't feel my leg. Okay, see you tomorrow. Orthopod comes in. Bone looks good. You're healing. Oh, I can't feel my leg. So that's another great book. Oliver Sacks wrote the book Awakenings about, about von economal encephalopathies. My grandmother had von second. Born Economo Encephalopathy, 1910, uh, as a young immigrant. Later developed Parkinson's, secondary Parkinson's. So what we're talking about here is a viral, a viral infection in, in, in these particular striatum regions. Okay? Getting back to Dr. Timmy's question. Yeah, that's Oliver Sacks, and it does look like Robin Williams. So the Lewy body dementia or dementia with Lewy body, patients may present first with the nightmares, nightmares or uh, hallucinations. And again, the motor disturbance, the motor disturbance looks the same, but it's a different disease. But they still have, but Lewy, Dr. Lewy identified Lewy bodies within uh, both populations. What else? Another awakening can be due to Dr. Corsius in the 60s. Dr. Corsius, when he wrote about when he discovered L dopa. But that's not, that's, rather than an awakening, that's a freedom. After James Parkinson's talked about Parkinson's disease, Dr. Hall described Parkinson's as paralysis agitans, where the patient is trapped in the body. So, personal story. When I was a teenager, I could pick up my grandmother, put her in the car. She was, she was aphasic at that time, but when we would drive back at church, when we would, I'd pick her up, put her in the car, I'd drive, and uh, didn't matter what kind of church we went by, didn't matter in New Hampshire. Greek church, Episcopal church. So paralysis agitans, you need to think the patient is trapped, okay? Neurocog sustained, I like to think, here we go, brain power, wattage, energy over time. That's complex attention. That's sustained attention. That's what we talk about. That's what we think about. That's kind of what I train for. So I'm not lifting weights like a 20-year-old kid. I'm trying to work on my wattage. So I try to read and I try to study to work on my own brain power. The, attentive, uh, the selective attention, I like to think of that as bird dogging. You're on top of something. Me, divided attention is very difficult. It's difficult for me to do divided attention. I, can't, I, I need to be in a cubicle. I need to be a bird dog. The executive function for soldiers, for soldiers, I always say, hey, you have to write an operational plan to drive three vehicles down the street. What is your op plan for your life? So executive function, op plan, making coffee, executive function. What is your operational plan? So planning, decision making, uh, the overriding, if you will, that's what we call in the military the after action report. So you're able to do, able to critique your behavior. Um, learning and memory is another neurocognitive domain. So learning, learning and memory, important question here is, remember with your, your troops with the TBI, can they lay down new memory? Many could not. Many had the neuroplasticity, and the troops that we're talking about, we're not talking about the mild traumatic brain injuries. We're really, ha we had moderate to severe, so we had subdurals. We had folks that had cran craniotomies. So immediate memory, recent memory, language, language, first clue is that word finding, that word finding. That's why people play word games. That's why we communicate. That's why the Prior speakers were talking about, hey, let's relax, let's talk, let's have dialogue, because this is stimulation. Onigayishimasu, teach me, right? When I meet John from the VA, what can John teach me? Oh, something, because I don't know John. So, and receptive language, expressive language as well. Hmm? Uh, perceptual motor, that's why we have people draw the clock. You know, you have a nice handshake, how do you do? Then when they draw that clock in your office or in the emergency room, quick, quick, 
it gives you an idea of how they're processing, right? Draw a clock, and I want you to put 10 minutes of one. So you have to draw the clock, you have to put 12, three, six, but you have to figure out what's, what's the shorthand, what's the little hand, all right? Social cognition, social cognition is, um, Again, with a brain injury, with a brain injury, your head, your brain shears, so the frontal lobe is injured. So it may be, may have apathy, or they may have that impulsivity, or the social cognition that we think of is when I'm looking at Teresa and she's nodding at me and she's giving me eye contact. So I think she's paying attention. Where, where Richard is sleeping. Oh, just kidding. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, jeez. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. You Thank you so I much. Sleeping. No, I was, I, was I, I was looking for somebody who was sleeping, but nobody was sleeping. I love that. I love that because, again, I grew up in the... <clears throat> I love that. I think it's so important to document. And I think, what do you do? Good for you. Even me. Right, because you don't, again, so what we're talking about with, uh, do I call your attorney? Oh, yes. Sir. 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 <laughs> Kiss the ring. <laughs> so, what John is talking about is so important to document. So important. And that's why we should not be, has, where are the neuropsychologists? Are there many neuropsychologists? Are there any here? That's another reason I'm, I recommend to go into the Brain Injury Association of Maine or New Hampshire, because I believe, I'm a big believer in neuropsychiatric uh, documentation and metrics. Right? One easy example, the Department of Defense, everybody has that ANAM, right? And in, in Maine, your Maine National Guard has both the impact testing and the ANAM prior to deployment. And what I'm talking about there is a uh, computerized uh, screen, if you will. Um, as a lawyer, for in aging or head injury or trauma, it's important to document your baseline because if you don't have your baseline or, or your assessment, how do you base your rehabilitation? And we're talking about psych testing. I also threw in as a physician neuroimaging, which hopefully Lear, Lear's generation will have more of that, but we really don't have a lot of imaging. The imaging I, we see is from the, guy, the folks in the emerging room. They're getting a CT because they want to make sure there's no bleed, they're not bleeding. What's in the cranium? Blood, brain, CSF, right? So, the, get to answer, answer that question, yes, very important to document metrics, metrics, neuropsych. Very important to find good neuropsych practitioners who can do that documentation for you. Is that okay? Can you delete that? So here's, here's an uh, imaging here. And basically this is imaging, uh, uh, pet imaging from a meth user. So the meth user, you can see the changes in that striatum, the part of the brain I showed you before with Parkinson's. So you can see, and many meth users will develop Parkinson's. Adolf Hitler is one. So changes in, this, in the striatum from meth amphetamine. So although that got better after detox, you're really not seeing much of that frontal lobe. That frontal lobe is where your emotion is. So the rehabilitated meth user is very apathetic. Apathetic, athymic, no feeling. Here's my equation for Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance. As physicians, we always talk to patients, I always talk to patients with their blood pressure. Blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. This is how I explain perfusion. The rule of the artery is supreme. So you want to perfuse your brain, kidney, heart, etc. 
another point here. When we talk about sleep, when we talk about sleep, and when we talk about sleep and PTSD, my drug of choice really is prazosine. Uh, one milligram, two milligrams. As a primary care physician, I learned about prazosine when I learned about mini press. Do you use prazosine, Bruce? Yeah, your clients. It helps, right? Where are the medical students? Do you want to tell us how it works? <laughs> right. As an alpha blocker, that's how it works. Right, very good. It's an alpha-1 blocker. So basically what, what, what Lee is saying is as an alpha blocker, you're blocking that adrenaline in your brain. So you're controlling that nightmare. You're controlling that nightmare, and you're able to rehabilitate. But the other part here that we were talking about, mini prazosine is mini press. So it opens up your pipes. So when you stand up, don't be surprised that the patient doesn't drop their blood pressure. So that's why it's important to have good primary care, psychiatry, dialogue, collaboration, cooperation. Okay. Uh, again, when, when you talk about TBIs, people will be quantifying, or people will say to you, people will say to you, Traumatic brain injury, oh, he has a moderate to severe, or he has a mild to moderate, right? So documentation, but this is, this is where you're, this is the DIVBIC, you go to the DIVBIC site, this is the DIVBIC definition for a traumatic brain injury. The important part here is, as I mentioned before, this is really more, oh, where, huh. the, the post-traumatic amnesia is a good indication of your dimmer switch. You get dinged, so you're in the ring, you get knocked down, you're, not, you have a, you're walking, talking, you have a Glasgow coma scale of 13, 14 maybe. You might think it's mild, but with, with more careful history and paying attention to the circuitry and the, and the post-traumatic amnesia with no memory greater than 24 hours, that's a moderate. So that's important, it's important in your law practice. So when people are talking to you about mild TBI, moderate TBI, I mean, severe is that three to eight Glasgow coma scale, that's where they're gonna be, uh, that should be pretty clear. The mild to moderate, that some people will be confusing, that's where you'll have to get this, use this definition. You okay? I think that's good. Uh, Glasgow coma scale, highest is a 15, Lowest is a three. As I mentioned before, most of the folks that we had uh, were threes. And as growing up in the emergency room, I thought uh, eight after eight, I didn't think I was going to see these guys walking, walking, talking. Uh, I, I have my own timer here. Where, but in the civilian community, we're talking about most trauma, most head trauma. 50% is, is from automobile accidents. In the patient population greater than 65, falls. So the uni, uh, United Kingdom, United Kingdom actually did a study and they, they said that 30% of, uh, of their population greater than 65 years old will fall every year, 30%. And of that 30%, 30% will have subarachnoid hemorrhage, or, sub, or another 30% will have subdural. Interesting, interesting, right? Because again, the main point is that vulnerable population, vulnerable population, difficult to recover. That's why we stress, that's why we stress sensory, he, eyes, ears, language, speech, gait, ballet, movement, Feldenkrais, everything, Tai Chi Chong, Parque Chong. That's why we emphasize balance, 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 because we fear falling. We, life is movement, right? Live the Shiva. Life is movement. Life is not being tied to a wheelchair. Life is movement. So add alcohol to this, lower level of consciousness, i.e. Glasgow, longer time in the hospital, 
change in cognitive status and memory impairments, right? Memory impairments. So another term that, does that, do the, do the Rancho scales come up to you? So the Ranchos, a teaching point here, had a troop from Maine, Marine, of Rancho level four. He, kind of, he was a big Marine. People thought he was aggressive, but he was confused. Again, he had a subdural hematoma. He was a Glasgow three. So when he was with us, he was a Rancho of four. He was confused, confused and frustrated because he's a young body, but a, 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 a rehabilitating brain. The, the point, my point there is that as opposed to major tranquilizers to treat his aggression and agitation, to treat his aggression is talk. But medically, first choice is beta blocker. Big guy. Uh, one more plug for addiction and, and addiction and circuitry. This is uh, National Institutes of Drug Abuse. Chronic disease, compulsive behavior, that's the circuitry. So my point here is that these are substance medication induced neurocognitive disorders. But I think when we study addiction and pathways, we'll learn more about circuitry of the brain. And I have 15 minutes, 10 minutes. I just, I remember taking my dad at 89 to uh, Jerry Syke for, because he was still driving in New Hampshire. So I said, Dad, you know, I think what we want to do is get, we want to get a driving valve, so a AAA mini neurocognitive, as opposed to being mean to my dad, he let me drive his car, so why should I be mean, right? You hear a lot of 50-year-old people telling you stories, and they sound pretty mean to me. So we went and had the neurocog testing, and he knew he didn't do that well. And so it was not as traumatic. Of course, it took away his independence, but it was not as traumatic as me just being a mean son. And like, you, like Richard said, you have documentation there. So I don't know how well people would do uh, on these tests after cannabis. I do know the Columbia paper points out that the fatality rate has tripled in the last 10 years associated with the THC and the safety issue of cannabis, okay? And we, we have breakouts with Becky later to talk about cannabis because as we talked about, I think, uh, I mean, I worked with Dr. Nathan Klein back in the 70s and, uh, in, in, and what I am reading and seeing now with cannabis and cannabis circuitry receptor sites is what I saw in the 80s with serotonin. That's how I view it. So it deserves attention. Uh, that's not my name. <laughs> but Stacy, I only have 10 minutes left. That was a, that was, that statement was placed in a difficult position for me to hear about the cannabis because it wasn't fluid with comparing it to opioids or saying this person had uh, X number of drinks and was tested for their driving ability. It was a, a statement out of place, I thought. So that can be for a further discussion. I just want everyone to know that they should be thinking about that, I suppose. Say again. So my statement of motor vehicle fatalities should be, and the paper that I put in the slide, should be for later discussion? Okay. So the point I made with the Columbia paper, uh, the Columbia School of Public Health defines driving fatalities as dead within that one hour, the golden hour. So in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, West Virginia, uh, Illinois, Hawaii, California, they all have tox toxicology. So the incidence of cannabis in the blood in these highway fatalities has tripled in the last decade. And then through discussion later, maybe in the group, we can tease out the, uh, what else was there. Okay? So, so as we were talking 
as we were talking regarding cannabis, in order to understand the circuitry, we have to understand where these uh, CB1, CB2 receptor sites are. Most CB1 receptor sites are forebrain and uh, hippocampus. So executive function, memory. Opioid overdose, the mu and delta receptors, hindbrain. Not so many, not so many, very few CB1 receptors in the hindbrain. Why is that important? Because the opiate overdose, you stop breathing, right? Because of the, where they're located. Uh, just, and I just list here the cannabis use disorder. And uh, cannabis use disorder, and NIDA recently put out, did you see that, uh, the PET scans from severe cannabis use disorder in the NIDA publication? shows changes in, in dopamine release in the striatum. So these are things that Richard brings up. Where are the metrics? Uh, lastly, I think I have two minutes. I'm a big believer in cognitive behavior therapy. And I'm a big advocate for seeking safety. Seeking safety. Seeking safety. And seeking safety is excellent cognitive behavior therapy for those who have been traumatized and who self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. From the, from the National Center for PTSD, if you go to that site, you will see that patients with trauma stress-related disorders, 50, 60% will self-medicate. That's why it's very important, very important to be cautious to what you prescribe. Be, not only for diversion, but what you prescribe your patient can abuse. So it's, and uh, do no harm. All right, so I think I'm right on time. I'm right on time. You were nodding quite, Linda. Seeking safety, right. And we'll go back to that book. So Dr. <coughs> Najavis, I think uh, she's in Boston. You ought to reach out to her, bring her up here as a speaker. So cognitive behavior therapy, you are exercising your brain, exercising, changing your behavior, shaping your behavior, putting effort into your behavior. It's like having back pain. So I don't want any medications for my back pain. I want to hang upside down. I want to work on my crunches. I want to work on my core. I want, that's me, and, right? So what else can you say about the Seeking Safety book? Where do you work? I work in the Health Center in Richmond, Maine. In Richmond? Yeah. And you use this? Your therapist use Seeking Safety? I use this um, in my treatment for people Great, great. Four minutes. Cliff, can you help me? Anything else well, that I, I admitted? I had a question. Wait, wait. Thanks, Marilyn. No, you don't need any help. You're, you're, you did a great job. But I have a question. Um, at, at, in our clinic, um, a mood and memory disorder clinic, we see a lot of people with um, relatively minor, what we would think of as minor head injuries, but with persistent neurocognitive dysfunction. So of course, um, neuropsychological testing by, uh, paid for by disability insurance companies uh, always ends up implying that the person is malingering uh, or has anxiety or psychological problems. And, uh, you know, clinically, we're thinking the psychological problems are due to their disability or secondary to their injury. And I, I think uh, increasingly the data are suggesting that uh, minor injuries, particularly repetitive minor injuries, can do some persistent damage. Can you uh, Absolutely. just comment? Absolutely, and that's what we were talking about over here with Richard. So, so, and you're talking about so mood disorders, risk-taking behavior, and sometimes in, in bad places at wrong times. Uh, I I with slipping on, slipping on a wet floor. oh, that easy type. Oh, slipping on a wet floor. No, okay, so I'm I'm moving that mood. I was I was exaggerating mood disorder. Okay, so Dr. Cliff Singer is talking about repetitive, mild, traumatic brain injuries. Yes, and persistent. and persistent mood changes. Right, 
and we go back to Richard's question and the documentation and most of the documentation we can do our neuropsych testing but we don't have that baseline to compare it to and even if you do the imaging we don't have the sophistication of the imaging at this time I think I do refer you to Dr. Amen's A-M-E-N clinics so he has the largest library of SPEC single photon emission computerized tomography and just by looking at the library you learn yourself and, and Richard will learn too the lawyers will learn too so Dr. Dr. Amen Amen clinics he his, the closest clinic to New England is in New York he has one in Washington DC but he has the largest spec imaging library so so the dilemma that we have here repetitive head injuries not necessarily violence just accidents but oh by the way and this part well, how old 40 ish uh, all ages they come to us from the 30s into the 80s so good point so the point the point here is that we have in 2016 we have many people out there with multiple mild TBIs that don't have the documentation ie the neuropsych testing documentations and they're receiving compensate comp and pen from the state for disability so this so as a physician we're trying to do best for them while the inspectors are saying while the inspectors not the psychiatrists are saying that the, those patients are malingering and dr. dr. Singer as a psychiatrist he can make that diagnosis of malingering but he knows something's not quite right neurocognitively so he's writing his note uh, the, the, the forgetfulness the language skills etc plus he's documenting it with his neuropsych partners and I'm getting the hook. <laughs> you are getting the hook. And actually, Dr. Barakas is going to run one of the networking tables today at lunch. So if you want to talk with him further about this or other topics or anything about veterans, please consider having lunch with him today uh, because I think it'll be a really in inspiring conversation, especially with all your history. So Dr. Barakas, thank you very much.